it needs no introduction but i'll just try my attempt to give a little bit of what he has done over the past many 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 years he wears many many hats he is world most renowned coach author who has written great award winning books like what got you here what got you there won't get you there triggers both ranked by amazon in the top 100 best books of all time in the leadership and success category he is also recently chosen as the winner of the lifetime award for leadership by the harvard institute for coaching he is the also the only two time thinkers 50 award winner from the which is a leadership thinker in the world he's been ranked as the world's number one executive uh, coach and top 10 business thinker and he has remained in this position for the past 8 years dr goldsmith is a professor of management practice at the dartmouth tech school of business and he has been again a keynote speaker a tedx speaker and so many other hats he's been wearing and again a great evangelist of inclusive leadership thank you so much masha for joining us uh, today in the evening i'm not sure if i have done justice to all the long list but i've tried to <laughs> you i am i'm sure uh, people will go through your bio which many a times is a kind of daunting for a lot of people mere mortals like us but looking forward to the session i must tell you this book how women rise has been one of my favorite in the last few reads i really enjoyed the session with you and uh, sally when we met in bombay and i look forward that all of us will be able to learn lot more today thank you so much marshal well thank you so much for inviting me i will briefly introduce myself and we'll get started i am marshal i'm from a small town called valley station kentucky i went to undergraduate school and graduate school in indiana i got a a phd at ucla the graduate school of management i was a college professor and dean when i was very very young then for 41 years i've done three predominant things i travel all around the world speaking and teaching i've been to 102 countries and on american airlines alone i have 11 million frequent flyer miles so i'm a mega mega flyer i just flew to delhi from ixtapa mexico so i've just been on a very very long journey uh ixtapa to mexico city to london to delhi uh so the first thing i do is speaking and teaching I'm most famous for coaching executives so I've been the coach of Ford and Pfizer and Glaxo and the World Bank and the Mayo Clinic and on and on and on and what I love about coaching is that's where I learn everything I learn so much from coaching although I'm supposed to teach them I actually learn far more than I teach and then I write books and articles so I've got a great life been married 44 years my wife's a psychologist my daughter's a professor at Vanderbilt a couple of uh, grandkids my son's an entrepreneur so life is good life is good Now what are we going to be talking about today? I'm going to share some of the highlights from my book How Women Rise. This book has been really very successful and it's popular around the world. So I'm really been happy with the book. And again, this is with my great friend Sally Helgeson. Um oh, what a thing I forgot. I like getting emails. Send me an email marshall at marshallwilson.com. If you send me an email, I can't promise to get back to you immediately. I'll get back to you eventually. And, and and also my website www.marshallwilson.com I give everything away all my materials online you may copy and share and download and duplicate and use my material in, in kind of any way that you wish and what are our goals first I want to talk about the background of our book and how Sally and I worked together on the book then I'm going to share some of the key concepts from the book I'm not going to cover everything obviously and and talk about implications for career development and coaching and then hopefully this will help both women who want to get ahead and leaders who want to help them get there I'm going to share some key learnings from Peter Drucker and discuss how this relates to women in leadership and then I'm going to share uh I've done a lot of programs for women in leadership there's 10 women 10 10 minutes that women tend to like the most so I'm going to share that with people in the room and talk about hey be a little more happy and have less guilt let us begin as we journey through life uh, a good question is What is power? Well, power can be defined as our influence potential. And one thing I'm really happy about our book is we have received virtually zero negative political feedback from the left or the right. And to write a book about women with I mean virtually no negative political feedback left or right I just make me happy because the book is not about politics and I think one reason that the book doesn't get any negative political feedback is we don't make value judgments. We're not saying in the book that women should strive for higher levels of influence and power. 
we believe it's each person choice. We do believe the world would be a little bit better if there were more women in positions of higher power. And this book is for women who want to do this, or perhaps if you coach women who want to do this. So we're not saying you should do it. On the other hand, if you want to do it, we think these are some tools that will help you in your journey to, to have more influence and more power. Now, some reflections from great leaders that I've worked with who are women. Overall, women get better 360 degree feedback than men from others, not from themselves. What does that mean? Women tend to be ranked by other people as better, leader than, better leaders than men. On the other hand, they rank themselves as worse leaders than men. One of the biggest challenges of all the women I've coached is women are too hard on themselves. One of the most common comment that they give women that I coach, please don't be too hard on yourself. And by the way, in India, double guilt for you. <laughs> One of the things I'm going to talk about is perfectionism. In India, you get a little double guilt, a perfect wife, perfect mother, perfect friend, perfect daughter, uh, perfect boss, perfect team member, perfect colleague, and the extra special, perfect daughter-in-law. Yes, a little bonus guilt for all of those of you in India, the, the mother-in-law factor. Now, positive self-promotion. One of the biggest challenges that Sally and I have come up with in our book is that women are reluctant to claim their achievements. Women tend to have a hesitancy for self-promotion and they tend to have a negative view of terms like self-promotion, terms like even ambition. And, and it's important to recognize effective self-promotion does not equal arrogance. If you believe in the product, don't be ashamed to promote it. And one thing that women do much more than men is expecting others to simultaneously notice and reward our contributions in life. Um, if you think about it, have you ever had this told yourself this, my good work should speak for itself. My good work should speak for itself. And that's basically ridiculous. Do you really believe God is gonna fly down from the sky and recognize you for your good work? If that were true, no company would need a marketing function. They just make good products and they'd speak for themselves. Well, every company needs a marketing function and so do you. And one of the reasons women have problems with self-promotion is they see men who are overly self-promotional and they say, I don't want to be like that person. Well, that doesn't mean you have to be ridiculously self-promotional or overly self-promotional. On the other hand, be open to really taking responsibility for your own life and career and don't be ashamed to promote yourself because you're probably worth promoting. And by the way, this next part might be a little hard for some women to hear. If you've been telling yourself, I shouldn't have to do that, you might have a little bit of an ego issue. What does that mean? Well, it's kind of a big ego when a person says, I really shouldn't have to promote myself. My work is so good, it should speak for itself. It shouldn't be my problem. Well, really, you're not better than everybody else. You're not above marketing and you're not above self-promotion. And if you want to get ahead, that's one thing you need to think about. How can you effectively promote yourself in your career? Now, this next concept is a great concept. By the way, let me talk about how I started working with my friend Sally. We randomly got an email from Mike Dulworth, a mutual acquaintance, and he said, crazy idea. He said, Marshall, you wrote this book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, which I've read a couple of times. And he said, great book. He said, it's largely revolving around men's issues. And there's a lot of separate issues women have that I don't think are well addressed in the book. Well, I got that feedback a couple of times before. I thought it made sense. And he said, you know, you and Sally are great friends. Why don't you get together and write a book like that only just for women? So, you know, Sally and I talked on the phone. We thought, great idea. So Sally actually wrote the book. She's a great writer. I could not have written the book. I can't write as well as she can. She's the lead author, but I played a role in the book and helped out as best I could. And she used a format from my previous book. So we had a great partnership on the book. By the way, we've known each other 25 years, so we're old friends. Now, putting your job before your career. This is a concept I learned from Sally. Never heard of it before. It's kind of counterintuitive. We tend to think, if I do a good job, I should get ahead. 
Well, if you really back away and think about it, not so much. If you do a good job at this level, it means you're doing a great job at this level. It doesn't necessarily mean you're ready to go to the next level. What got you here won't get you there. Well, let me give you my personal history with this concept. And this is probably the best coaching I didn't act on. One of my great mentors, a man named Dr. Paul Hersey. And I met him and I was a college professor and he was kind enough to let me follow him around and try to learn what to do like he did it. And he was probably the highest paid consultant in the world in our field at that time. And one day he got double booked and he said, Marshall, can you do what I do? I said, Paul, I don't know. He said, look, I need help. Can you do this? I said, I don't know. He said, look, I'll pay you a thousand bucks for a day. I was making $15,000 a year. He wanted to pay me a thousand dollars a day. I was 28 years old. That was 41 years ago. Thousand dollars for one day was a lot of money. I said, Paul, sign me up. I did a program for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company in New York. It was very successful. They were angry when I showed up, but they loved me. And they said, well, send Marshall again. Paul said, do you want to do this again? I said, sir, yes, sir. Well, that's how I got into this business. And that's the good news. Here's the coaching I didn't act on. About two years later, Paul Hersey called me in and said, Marshall, you're making too much money. You're doing a great job. Your clients are happy. You're making a lot of money. You're never going to be the person you could be. You're like a chicken running around repeating that same behavior over and over. A chicken running around with your head cut off. You're selling days, but you're not being the person you could be. You know, for 10 years of my life, I didn't act on that nearly as much as I wish I would have. I was at the New York Stock Exchange. Rick Cully, great friend of mine, worked there. And I did a program, got ranked 4.8 out of 5. And I talked to Rick and I said, you know, Rick, um, how can we make it better? Rick said, Marshall, you're asking the wrong question. You ought to be asking the question, how can you make your life better? How can you make a bigger contribution to the world? This program is about as good as it's going to get. And the little incremental you change is probably not worth it. Then I met Francis Hasselbein and Peter Drucker, and they really set me on a different path of writing and thinking and, and totally changed my life. A great quote from Peter Drucker is, do not sacrifice tomorrow on the altar of today. Well, a great challenge women have, and I think much more than men, is putting the job before the career. Getting so focused on doing a great job, you're not really looking at that bigger picture of your career. Now, why don't we become the people that we want to become? Well, I'm probably the only teacher you've ever met who's collected input from tens of thousands of people who've been to my classes. And I ask them, are you going to do what I teach? Well, years ago, my biggest client was a company called Johnson & Johnson, a wonderful company. I had the privilege of working with their top 2,000 leaders, all the way from Ralph Larson, the CEO, down to number 2,000. At the end of my talk, they were asked a question. Are you going to do what Marshall just taught you? 98% said yes. A year later, about 70% did something and 30% zero. Not one minute. I'm not ashamed of these numbers. I'm proud of these numbers. 70% of 2,000 people is 1,400 people getting evaluated by 10 coworkers each. 14,000 people have a little better life. I'm certainly not ashamed of that. Well, I got to interview the people that didn't do anything and said, why didn't you do this? Well, their answer had nothing to do with ethics, values, or integrity. They won an award that you're most the most ethical company in the world. They're good people. I'm sure you're listening to me. You're all good people. It had nothing to do with intelligence. They're smart people. I'm sure you're smart people. The reason people did nothing had to do with a dream. This is a dream I've had for years. I'm going to make a prediction. Many of you have had this dream. Many of you have had this same dream and many of you have had this same stupid dream on a recurring basis for years. And it's going to describe why in life you don't do what you know you should. Some of you are thinking, he doesn't know my dreams. What's he talking about? Don't bet against me on the dream. And by the way, I'm going to ask you to send in a note on the question part and, and answer my question. In terms of the dream, what's it sound like? You know, I'm incredibly busy right now. Given pressures of work and home and new technology that follows me everywhere, I'm about as busy as I've ever been. You know, sometimes I feel overcommitted. Every now and again, my life feels just a little bit out of control. 
Yet you know I'm working on some very unique and special challenges right now. And I think the worst of this is going to be over in about four or five months. And after that, I'm going to take two or three weeks and get organized and spend some time with the family. I'm going to begin my healthy life program. And it's not going to be crazy anymore. Uh, if you can make a little note there in the chat box and answer two questions. One, have you ever had a dream that sounds like that before? And number two, if the answer is yes, how many years you've been having this same dream? And if my friendly coordinators, if you do get some comments, can let me know what people are saying. Yes, um, I think everyone, if you want to leave any kind of a comment for Marshall out there, you can put it in the chat box, but you need to might possibly put it not privately, but to everyone. Just select to everyone, like Shudapto has just done it. Hi, Marshall. And that's the way to go. I think people are writing it to me or privately. You don't need to write to me. You need to just write to everyone. Please go ahead, uh, Shudapto, in case you have any kind of comments, keep putting on the chat box. Thank you so much, Marshall. Please continue. Okay, very good, very good. The myth that people have is this. If I do a great job, I'll get ahead, and life is logical and life is fair. Well, life really isn't very logical. Life isn't that fair, and decisions are made by decision makers. Peter Drucker taught me a great lesson. Every decision in life is made by the person who has the power to make the decision, and if you want to get ahead, you need to influence decision makers. Well, this is very important for women. Women tend to have higher personal expectations than men. I'm going to talk about that when I get into perfectionism. Women can often care so much about the team that they sacrifice themselves. For example, when someone offers you a parallel job or even perhaps a promotion, women are much more likely to say, the team needs me right now. In other words, they're sacrificing their career for the team. Now, in the short term, that sounds wonderful. That's a great thing. How nice. In the long term, maybe you could be doing a whole lot more for the world, though, if you're at a much higher level in the organization, and that's what you're sacrificing. And again, our book, Sally and I, we're not trying to tell you what you want to be. I'm not here to tell anybody who they want to become. On the other hand, if you do want to get ahead, we're just trying to help you with some ideas on how to do it. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say I'm going to focus everything on my job and this immediate team and just do the best I can and, and turn down promotions and then wonder down the road why you didn't get promoted. Because one of the goals is you don't want to feel regret. You don't want to say, I wish I would have. Now, the perfectionism trap. Women have much more of a need than men to try to be the perfect everything and everybody, at both work and at home. And part of this is overvaluing expertise. In the United States, I just read some research that's published in the New York Times yesterday about this. Girls are making much higher scores in school than boys, yet boys are getting much promoted much more than girls. One of the reasons girls tend to be much more focused on perfectionism and overvaluing expertise as opposed to overvaluing relationships. Focused on trying to do everything so right that they have trouble letting go. Overvaluing expertise. Another part of this is the disease to please. The desire to be that perfect everything to everybody. Another issue women have much more than men, and I love this chapter in the book we call ruminating. Now what does that mean? Women worry more than men. Just worrying things over and over and over. What is ruminating? It's something cows do. They chew things up, but over and over and over, it's called ruminating to break it down. Well, yeah, leave ruminating to cows. And one of the things I share with women much more than men is, number one, don't be too hard on yourself. And number two, don't worry too much. You don't have to over explain everything either. And then finally, this is a great one for many of the women listening. Many women are great at building relationships, but they do not leverage these relationships. In fact, they're almost embarrassed about leveraging the relationship. That makes it seem somehow dirty or wrong. Well, gee, I should just try to help you because I'm a good person. Then they feel guilty about asking that person to help them. One thing I'm going to share with you is don't be afraid to ask for help. And don't feel you're necessarily imposing on others when you ask for help. In my coaching process, every leader that I coach asks everyone around them for help. That's a regular part of the process. 
And if you look at our research, the ones that do the best job of it tend to improve dramatically. Don't be ashamed to ask for help and don't feel you're imposing when you ask for help. There's something called the Ben Franklin effect. Ben Franklin was a famous American patriot and Franklin effect says, if you ask important people for help, they actually feel better about you. Why? It's kind of a compliment. You're saying, I respect you. I look up to you. I really could use your help. So be willing to not just build those great relationships, which by the way, women do a great job of. Don't be so hesitant to leverage them. Now, learning from Peter Drucker, I'm going to share a couple of great points. If you don't know who Peter Drucker is, the world's authority on management. I mean, I got ranked number one leadership thinker in the world. My intellect compared to this man is that of a 10 year old boy. So smart and he taught me so many things. Peter Drucker said, our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove we're smart and not to prove we're right. Well, we're not here on earth to prove we're smart. We're not here to prove we're right. We're here to make a positive difference. Here's one reason I think it's so important that more women get promoted. I believe more women could make a much more positive difference if they were in higher levels in big organizations. They can make a positive difference anyway. When they get promoted, they're gonna influence much more people. Next learning from Peter Drucker. Every decision in life is made by the person who has the power to make the decision. Make peace with that. Decisions are not made by a person who's fair. They're not necessarily logical or rational. Decisions are made based on one and only one variable power. Whoever has the power to make the decision is gonna make the decision. Next learning point from Peter Drucker. If I need to influence the decision maker and that person has the power to make the difference, the decision maker is the customer and I'm a salesperson. They don't have to buy, I have to sell. It's not the customer's job to buy, it's your job to sell. Well, if the decision maker is gonna decide if you get promoted or not, and there's several people applying for that job beside you, the decision maker doesn't have to buy, you have to sell. Sell what you can sell, change what you can change, and make peace with what you can't sell and what you can't change. Now, I'm gonna share a part of the class that women tend to like the most, then we're gonna stop and take a break and we're gonna have questions. First, uh, for the next 10 minutes, we're gonna have four rules. And I want everyone listening to follow these four rules. Now these four rules are gonna sound simple, but I'm gonna warn you in advance, these four rules are very, very hard to follow for many people. They're very, very hard to follow for many people. And you might feel uncomfortable even hearing about the four rules. Rule number one, for every woman listening, for the next 10 minutes, you cannot try to learn something. Put those pencils and papers away. No note taking. You cannot try to learn something for the next 10 minutes. No learning. Take a deep breath. Ah. Rule number two, you cannot try to become more productive. No trying to increase productivity for 10 minutes. Rule number three, not even think about becoming a better person. Not even consider becoming a better person. I hope you're feeling a little comfortable, uncomfortable already. The hard one is rule four. In the next 10 minutes, you cannot consider helping others. I want you to spend 10 minutes, this is only 10 minutes, to focus on one thing, your own happiness and self-acceptance. Just 10 minutes. I just did this with a very large group of women in India and women just broke down. They didn't just start crying, they just lost it. Nobody ever gave them 10 minutes before. 
oftentimes when I teach my class for women, like this, women have tears in their eyes. And then I point out, imagine this for a bunch of men. Men, the boys, no matter how difficult this may be, men, for the next 10 minutes, you must focus only on your own happiness and self-acceptance. Men have tears in their eyes. Well, it's not that women are better than men or worse, or men are better than women or worse. For most men, this is really not their problem. This is not their problem. They're more than happy to focus on their own happiness and satisfaction. Now, I want everybody to take a deep breath. Do your hands like this, and I want you to go, ah, breathing, breathing. Now, I'm a Buddhist. Buddha said, every time you take a deep breath, think it's a million. It's a million. So I want you to take a deep breath and think. It's a million. Everything that happened before this second in your life was done by an infinite set of women. What were their name? The previous years. I would like you to close your eyes. Think of the previous shoes. That infinite set of women that have made up your life. Think about all of the gifts those women have given to the youth that is here listening to me right now. Think about all the good they've done. And think about how hard all those women tried. Open your eyes. If any group of women did that many nice things, what should you say to these nice women? Thank you. Do your hands like and say thank you. Now, did these women make a little mistake or two? Who is the first person in life we need? Learn how to forgive ourselves. I've asked thousands of women around the world this question. When my child grows up, I want my child to be. And then I say, give me one word. One word comes up from women more than every other word combined, no matter what country I'm in. What's that word? You want your children to be happy? You want your partners to be happy? You want the people you love to be happy? You go first. You be happy. First person you need to learn how to forgive this person. Now, I want everybody to think of one person who makes you feel bad, guilty, angry, or crazy. Just one. Everybody think of one. Now I have a question. How much sleep is that person losing over you tonight? How much sleep is that person losing over you tonight? I've also asked thousands of women that question and what's the typical answer? Zero, 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 and another zero. Then I ask, who's being punished? Who's doing punishing? You don't have to like that person, respect that person, or agree with that person. Just tell yourself, I'm no longer going to let you make me feel bad. Life is too short. Life is too short. Now, a great story. Two monks are walking by the stream. The monks see a woman, and she has a beautiful silk dress on. The woman's crying. One monk goes over and goes, why are you crying? She says, I have on my beautiful silk dress my mother made, but I must cross the stream to get to the wedding. If I cross the stream, I'm going to ruin my beautiful silk dress. I don't know what to do. One of the monks says, we can't help you. We can't even touch women. Against the rules. The other monk says, ah, oh, the heck with the rules. Picks her on the shoulder, carries her across the stream, and drops her off on the other side. She's so happy. Thank you, good monk. Thank you. The monk is happy. Thank you. Thank you. 
he splashes back across the stream. His colleague, the other monk, is angry. You're a bad monk, a bad monk, a bad, bad monk. The wet monk says, why am I so bad? The angry monk says, you carried that woman. We're not even supposed to touch women, you bad monk. What do you have to save yourself? The wet monk says, things happen. They walk back to the hobo monks, all the way back. Bad monk, bad monk, bad monk. The wet monk dries off and goes to sleep. In the middle of the night, his colleague is still angry. He wakes him up. You're a bad monk. The sleepy monk says, why am I so bad? The angry monk, because you carried that woman across the stream. The sleepy monk says, what woman? The angry one monk says, the woman at the stream, don't you remember? The sleepy monk says, oh, her. I only carried her across the stream. You carried her all the way back to the monastery. When I teach my class for women, I say, you know what? Many of you are carrying people with you today. I can see them in your eyes. Leave them at the stream. Leave them at the stream. Quit carrying it around. The final advice before we have questions is this. As you journey through life, it's your path. As much as you possibly can, have that path come from where? In your heart. Any path that you pick is going to have trade-offs. Make peace. If you work full-time, your 14-year-old daughter is going to say, you're a bad mother, you worked all the time, you were never there for me. If you stay home, your 14-year-old daughter is going to say, you're a loser, you couldn't find a job. <laughs> uh, any path that you pick through life is going to have trade-offs. There is no perfect path. Make peace. Have that path come from your heart and make peace with the trade-offs. Final story. Farmer's rowing a boat up the big wide river. He looks upstream and here comes another boat. The boat gets closer to his boat. Um, he's angry. Be careful, be careful. You might hit my boat. It's such a big river. Be careful, be careful. Flat. The boat runs into his boat. The farmer is angry. He stands up and screams, You idiot, you fool. How could you hit my boat at such a big river? The boat. No one in the other boat. He's screaming at an empty boat. It's floating down the river. There's never anyone in the other boat. That person making you feel bad and guilty and angry and crazy. You get upset with them for being who they are. It makes about as much sense as getting upset with your computer for being a computer. And help it be a computer, that's what it is. You don't have to like that person, respect them, or agree with them. Just now you're going to tell yourself, you know what? Nobody can vote. Nobody can vote. Now, Hope you found our talk to be positive and useful. Hope you help you have a little bit better life. Help you in your journey to, if you would like to, help you in your journey to achieve more sense of power and influence in the world. And finally, even more important, maybe help you be a little happier and have a little less guilt. So, thank you very much. Now we're gonna have questions. And then when we have questions, um, I'll do my best to answer whatever question you ask me. And if you ask me a question and I'm not an expert, I'm just going to say I'm not an expert. So this is called feed forward. Uh, you ask me questions. I do my best to answer them. Now, again, I'm a Buddhist. Buddhist said, oh, I just say, it work for you. It does work for you. It's okay. Just don't do it. If you ask me questions, I give you my idea. If it works for you. If I don't know, I just say, don't know. If I got an idea, give me an idea. You say thank you. Thank you. If it's a brilliant idea, you say thank you. Stupid idea, you say thank you anyway. You have to do it. So then that way we get to cover a whole, whole bunch of stuff. So why don't we begin? Let's have two things. One, I'm going to ask you a question. What's the most important thing you just learned from me in the last 40 minutes? Write that down and send it in the chat box. What is the most important thing and how can it help you? What's the most important thing you learned and how can it help you? 
And then I'd like my fine coordinator just to read a couple of the responses. Thank you, Marshall. So everyone, you can put in your messages to Marshall of what you liked about this program. Please make sure that you're marking it to uh, not private, but to everyone so that we can all learn from each other. Very good. Okay, why don't you go first while we're waiting? What's the most important thing? <laughs> My first most important thing is that invest in yourself and do not shy away from you know, taking ownership of your own credibility and your achievements. And as right. I said, if you don't market yourself, there's no one else who is going to do it for you. Very good. Now, if I have to ask you a question, in the past, what's held you back from doing that? Um, sometimes, you know, maybe a conditional uh, upbringing where we are, as women, we are expected to be humble. Mm. Um, and um, also, you don't want to be seen bragging kind of a thing. And sometimes it's a very thin line difference. I think over the years, I've kind of walked that fine balance over a period of time. But I found one thing, Marshall, which another um, a good mentor of mine, Geraldine Labor, the founder of Oxygen Media, she shared with me how you could overcome this. And I would like to share it with the rest of the crowd. She said, good. if you don't like to blow your trumpet, you create your women friends network toot their horns and they will toot back yours. And <laughs> that has worked wonderfully well for us. So I have great girlfriends and of course, lots of men who are mentors and sponsors. We toot each other's horns. And yes, we're able to get away that conditional guilt. But yes, these days I toot my own horn as well. <laughs> well, you know, that's one thing Sally said, that women are very good at building relationships, historically though, not leveraging. So what I like about what you all are doing to help each other is you're going, responding to what Sally said. You're not only building the relationship, which is good, you're leveraging the relationship, which is better for everybody. So excellent, excellent case study. I, I see a lot of messages coming on the chat box. Everybody's talking about self-esteem is important. Learn to acknowledge yourself. Be guilt-free. Be this hard on yourself. Don't be ashamed. Blow your trumpet. Yes, you need to. Uh, so, yes, Marshall, I think there's so much of takeaways from here. Um, and Sushilipto has been saying, and one of the, you know, uh, things he said, he loves the part asking for help. And right. I, I love that part too. And Marshall, um, we reached out to you asking for help and you're here. It's just about going and asking. So we never thought having a renowned speaker like you addressing everybody like this. And it's just about speaking and connecting with you. And of course, thanks to Right Selection Speakers Bureau. Um, their team has been fantastic to get this connection going. And that's what collaborative relationship is all about. Very good. Now we're going to have anybody has questions for me. And while they're writing the questions, I'm going to discuss what you just talked about, asking for help. This is a very important point. Don't be hesitant to ask for help. Uh, a lot of we're hesitant to ask for help. We, look, we feel like we're imposing or bothering people. Um, in my coaching, everyone I coach, men or women, gets confidential feedback. And they all ask everyone around them for help. All their key stakeholders, they say, for example, I want to be a better listener. Please help me. Give me ideas. And they do this feed forward process, which is constantly asking for help and thank you and listening and asking for help and thank you. And, and guess what? They get better. Now, there's something called the Ben Franklin effect. Ben Franklin was a fav famous early American, and he found out something very interesting. He had an enemy. He was a very powerful man who didn't like him very much. And then Ben Franklin said, you know, I have this book club, and you have this very special book, and I know it's an imposition, but it would mean so much to me if I could borrow the book, and you would do me this favor, and I would share it with the group and show it to them. He said after that, they had a great relationship. You see, when we ask people for help, it's a compliment to them. What you're saying is, I respect you. I can learn from you. you know, and I would appreciate it if you help me. Most people don't feel angry about that. They feel, they feel complimented. Everybody's not going to help you, of course. I think most good people will help you. By the way, one thing I'm very proud of is, in my coaching, my book Triggers, 27 major CEOs endorsed my book. Why am I so proud? These 27 people said things like this. I was a CEO of the year in the United States. I need help. It's okay. I'm the president of the World Bank. I need help. It's okay. 
30 years ago, no CEO would admit to having a coach. I'm very proud of that. By the way, I have someone call me on the phone every day. Her name is Jasmine. She listens to me read questions I wrote every day and provide answers every day. Why do I do this? Somebody said, don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. Why do I do this? I got ranked number one leadership coach in the world and number one uh, uh, executive thinker. I have a woman call me on the phone every day. Why? My name is Marshall Goldsmith. I'm too cowardly to do this by myself. I'm too undisciplined to do this by myself. I need help and it's okay. You know what? We all need help. And it's okay. We don't have to be ashamed. And that's a great advice, Marshall, out there, because I think that's the way we also seek mentors. It's been proven fact that women don't have mentors or sponsors. It's only when you go out, seek help, when you go out and ask for help, that's the time you also attract mentors and sponsors. And that's a great, great insight. I think we have some questions coming in. Uh, somebody asked for a book. Yeah, I'm going to read it out to you, Marshall. Sweetie asked for which book to ultimately... Uh, read and I said, of course, How Women Rise is the first book you should pick up, uh, definitely. Uh, so this is a this is a best selling book and I highly recommend it. And post this, there's one book which Sally also had written many many years ago, is known as Female Advantage. That's a book which I read some four years ago, and right. I definitely recommend that book to everyone again. Um, Pramila has a question out here: How to deal with a situation where expectations have mismatched and come out of that situation? So she's talking about how, how can she help or how can she uh, manage a situation where the expectations are mismatched and how can she come out of that situation? Well, sometimes she may not come out of the situation. That's another issue that women have more than men is reluctance to leave. Sometimes the best thing is say this didn't work. Maybe there were expectations that are not going to get fixed. On the other hand, let me give you my one best advice and that is just what is is don't blame blame doesn't help anybody don't say it's your fault or you said this or did that or don't blame your expectations are x and you know coming in my expectations are y maybe i didn't understand maybe it's my fault who cares my expectations were y what are we going to do and we work it sorry out. can i just ask whoever's typing please go on mute because we can't hear marshall speaking we can only hear the typing Yes, please, um, everyone, please go mute on that. We will only take questions on chat box because we have more than around 150 participants. Some of them have logged in from phones and all. Thank you so much. I, I in fact, I just saw a very interesting question from a couple of men in the group. So I'll also get a chance for the men to ask these questions because they are, they have to be the biggest allies. Shini has written out here three things men as allies can do to challenge stereotypes, confront bias and leverage their expertise to support their women rise at workplace. Beautiful question, Trini, thank you so much. So here are the men who want to support the women. What hmm. are the three things they can do possibly? Well, I think one is to just pay attention to what I just said, especially about women's hesitancy to promote themselves and realize that, you know, when they talk to a woman and the woman says, I'm not sure I'm quite ready yet, they could be 10 times more ready than the man who says, I'm ready. Because <laughs> the man, they're much more likely to say they're ready, even if they aren't. And the woman is much more likely to say she's not ready, even if she is. So the thing is, really dig a little deeper. And when you have three candidates, maybe two men and one woman, and the men seem, oh, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And the woman seems a little more hesitant. Start asking some deep questions. What you might find out is the woman is actually more qualified than the men. She's just not promoting herself as much. And the other thing is, with the woman, I would really encourage them don't be hesitant to push your best foot forward. Don't be hesitant to talk about what you can do. And remember, you're not competing with God. You're competing with the guy down the hall. <laughs> That's so true. Thank you so much, Marshall. In fact, another uh, um, gentleman, Shudapto, had a similar question. How can he support the women in his family and workplace? And I think you just answered how right. he can possibly do it. Um, and there are quite a few questions which has come in that how, does, how do women... Um, actually balance that you know whole thing about job versus career many women start looking at very short term and start looking at jobs and not long term so whenever there's a roadblock mm. um, it's family or life issues or personal issues 
And the first thing they do is they're not looking at a long-term career, but looking at a very short-term job specific right. thing. How do we mitigate that? Well, it's number one, it is very hard. Let's go back to my example in my own life. And I did not do it well for probably 10 years myself. So I'm not, I'm not preaching at others here. This is something I didn't do well myself for 10 years. What happens is it is very hard when you're doing well, when you're working hard, when you're under pressure, to sit there and say, how can I invest in my future? I'm going to give you a challenge. Make investing in your future an important part of your life. You have to make it an important part of your life. If you don't, the family, the job will take over and you'll do a great job where you are and you'll probably be stuck where you are. So really keep challenging yourself. In the same way, Paul Hersey challenged me. He said, Marshall, you can do more. You're not thinking, you're not doing research, you're not writing. You're not doing the big things that are gonna change your career. You're just doing the same thing over and over again. Good job of it. That's all you're ever gonna be. He was so true. So we need to expand our horizons, expand our vision of how we are looking at a career. And don't just look at the job which you're doing currently now. Please, I that job which you want, say five years down the line and start preparing for it today. I think that's what Marshall's message is. Be willing to go big. Fantastic. Think big, guys. That's how you go big at the end of the day. You, it's like, you know, what Buddha said, you become what you think, or rather you become what you also want to achieve. Great. Um, one person has mentioned, I can only see their mobile number. The, she or he had a question of asking help is great, but sometimes too much of frequent asking can convey a message that one is less competent or an, not an independent player. How can you explain this, Marshall? Well, I'd like you to send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. I'm going to send you my research study on this. The research study is called Leadership as a Contact Sport. This is 86,000 leaders from around the world. And I, I, don't, I can explain it very clearly. Leaders that get feedback, publicly admit what they want to work on, follow up on a regular basis with their people and do this stuff, are invariably seen as more effective leaders. Now, somebody may think you're weaker. The numbers are amazing. The numbers are quite the contrary. And by the way, this isn't a theory or a guess. There's 86,000 people that do this that I worked with. So the name of the study is called Leadership as a Contact Sport. My email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. I would love to see that study myself, Marshall. So we'll definitely write to you on that. In Definitely. fact, I, I would also like to share about this one tip out here, which Marshall, when I had attended the session in Bombay along with you and Sally, mm. uh, one of the things that Sally su suggested, asking for help is not a challenge. It's how you ask for help, which becomes a challenge. Right. If you're preparing, if you're clear and crisp of what help you need, if you've right. done your work that you have answered all the queries you could have done on your own right. there's nobody who will not ultimate i mean at least i have not found in my career anybody right. who said a genuine need for help they have said no so honestly speaking i don't think that's a challenge let me give you one other idea that i think might be helpful in how to do it see i always teach something called feed forward now i love feed forward in feed forward, you don't ask for feedback about the past. You ask for ideas for the future. If you come to a leader and say, give me some feedback. Let, I, let me know what I'm doing wrong. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. It can be embarrassing for both people. If you say, I want to do a great job in the future. Give me some great ideas to do even better. See how different that feels? One seems very negative and embarrassing. The other one is like upbeat and positive. Well, you probably going to learn about the same stuff anyway. This one seems a whole lot more positive than the other. So I wrote an article about that called Try Forward Instead of Feedback, which I love. Do feed forward. Marshall, yeah. I'll just wait. Could you please all mute yourself? If I try to mute all, then I'll mute Marshall also, which I'm sure you definitely don't want that. So I'm unable to do a mute all, and there are more than 115 participants right now. I can't keep checking everyone. You have to mute your thing because we can still hear some typing thing and others are getting disturbed. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Okay. I don't need to do anything, right? No, no, Marshall, you're good. <laughs> you're good. We don't want you to be mute out there. Yeah, it's getting confused. Uh, yes. Marshall, there is a question from Kajarina Dutta out here. She said, how do we overcome the fear of being rejected? Oh, that's a great one. That's a great one. Paul Simon had a story about that. She's asking cool. specifically. Fear of rejection over self-promotion. That if she's promoting herself and she gets rejected. That is exactly right. 
That is one of the great themes of human life that goes way beyond just getting promoted. Paul Simon has a great song. He said, some people never say the words, I love you. It's not their style to be so bold. Some people never say the words, I love you. But like a child, they're longing to be told. Well, it's- That was so beautiful. You're not gonna overcome the fear of rejection. It's part of being- Just love ourselves. As you said, we need to love ourselves. Thank you so much. You're not gonna overcome that fear of rejection. That's part of it, human. The thing is, just accept the fear of rejection and say, yeah, I'm afraid. I am afraid I'm gonna fail. You know what? If I don't go for it, I'm definitely gonna fail. Yeah, if you go for it, you might fail. If you don't go for it, you fail before you start. You know what? Everybody is like on the chat box saying it's lovely, it's authentic, whatever you're sharing is best. Uh, one of the questions which came from Payal out here is that um, it's seen in our society, I think it's globally in fact, I should not call it Indian because I've seen it across the globe. Uh, for a woman to be ambitious is not really considered a virtue. How do we leap over this and actually want to make a difference? Well, here's the question. Power can be defined as influence potential. If you want to influence the world and make the biggest positive difference, you have to have power. It's true. Well, do you really want to make a big positive difference in the world or not? And I'm not saying you should. Hey, I could be perfectly happy not to try to have power and influence. And Sally and I bend over backwards telling you we're not here to preach at anybody. On the other hand, if you believe in your heart, hey, I can make more of a positive difference in the world, then guess what? You're going to need power. And it might be painful to get it. Suck it up. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, so I'm actually just selecting some questions, guys. In case if you have more questions, keep it coming. We exactly have another five minutes before Marshall wraps up. And, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I have one final, you asked me this question, then I have my final thing I'd like to say. Yes, that's exactly. So before, and that's I said, Marshall will take five minutes for his wrap up. And in the meanwhile, I would also like to invite every one of you to look at our website. And I'm here doing self-promotion as Marshall Mitt suggested. We are here to do our self-promotion. So um, you must look at our upcoming program, LEAP, which is the Women Leadership Program. It's a six-month program with leadership skills and training along with a mentor whom you can ask for any kind of a help. He is a CXO leader and a cross-industry mentor. It's an award-winning program, and we'd love to see you out there. The applications are open as we speak, so please share it with your network, your friends, your sisters, your daughters. We have mentors who are both men and women, but we have mentees who are mid-career women and wanting to take them to the next level. So looking forward to seeing some of you out there. And um, somebody asked, how can I have this recorded session file? Yes, you will. This recording version will be uploaded on the YouTube in our thing and the link will be sent to all participants. Feel free to share it with your people in your network. I don't want anybody to miss out this great, great session with Marshall. It's, it's something which we should all share and learn from each other. Fantastic. And, um, and there are everybody saying uh, thank you. It seems that Marshall, you have been so wonderful that there are no more questions coming. So you can take your time. Ready? To, yes. I'm going to finish with my favorite coaching advice in the world. Is everybody ready? I yes, want every, sure. everybody smile. I want you to take a deep breath. I want your hand like this. I want you to go, ah, ah. Now, I want you to imagine you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. Here comes your last breath. Right before you take that breath, though, you're given a beautiful gift, the ability to go back in time and talk to the person listening to me right now. The ability to help that person be a better leader, much more important, the ability to help that person have a better life. What advice would that wise 95-year-old you, who knows what mattered in life and what did not matter and what was important and what was not important, what advice would that wise old person have for the you that's listening to me right now? You don't have to say anything or do anything or write anything. Answer that question in your mind. Some friends of mine, and by the way, whatever, whatever you're thinking now, do that. 
In terms of performance appraisal, that's the only one that will matter. That old person says you did the right thing, you did. That old person says you made a mistake, you did. You don't have to impress anyone else. Some friends of mine interviewed old people and asked them this question and said, what advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words. Be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not next year. Quit beating yourself up over the head. Be happy now. The great Western disease, I'll be happy when. When I get the money, status, BMW, promotion, condominium, we all have the same win. That old person's win. Be happy now. Don't be too hard on yourself. Number two, friends and family. Very important. And number three, if you have a dream, go for it. That's what this whole session is about. If you have a dream, go for it. You don't go for it when you're 35. You may not when you're 45. And you probably won't when you're 85. None of us are going to achieve all our dreams. The question is, did you at least try? Did I even try? Business advice is much different. Life is short. Have fun. Enjoy the, enjoy the journey. Do whatever you can do to help people, especially help other women. And don't be ashamed to have them help you. And then also do what you think is right. You may not win, at least you tried. Final thing is, it's been my honor to work with all of you. Hope you found my little session to be practical and useful. Hopefully, I hope you have just a little better life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marshall. We really appreciated your time. I think everybody learned so much. And uh, we hope that this association with you as well as Right Selection, and special thanks to actually Gotham and his team at Right Selection Speakers Bureau. Um, I think they do a wonderful job to get some wonderful global thought leaders like you to India and get everybody to learn from each other. And I do see that some of the people have participated in today's webinar, not only from India, but across the globe. So thank you so much, Marshall, for joining us. And thank you everyone for joining and contributing to this session. The session is a lot more meaningful with your inputs, with your questions. And as Marshall said, uh, he's uh, out there on the email as well as on the website. And he's also very active on Twitter. I know I can vouch for that. So you know how to catch him and the conversation can always continue from here. So awesome, everyone. And we wish you a great, great week ahead and a great evening. Thank you so much, Marshall. And, uh, and we hope that we will be able to continue this association further. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we are signing off over here. And we will, our team will be in touch with you and with your uh, coordinates where the EOJ is. Thank you, Marshall. Bye. See bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.